Arias thinks of itself as one of the more prudent yep. and disciplined non-bank lenders. Am I correct? I hope so, yes. Absolutely. Okay, so given better, how better much... Better than the alternative. That's yeah. true. Given how much money is flooding into direct lending, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars a year, you're familiar with sure. the figures? Yep. How is it possible to remain prudent and disciplined, or is this a time where increasingly it's pencils down? I think the base of all good credit decisions start with asset selectivity. So the way we think about performing through cycles is we have to find the best companies and make sure that we're invested in them. So we have a couple of benefits being that we've been in the business as long as we have and we have as much capital scale, probably the most significant of which is the size of our current portfolio. So right now we have about $70 billion of direct lending assets globally. We have investments in over 500 middle market companies. What we're finding now is over 50% of our new deal flow is coming from people that we have an existing relationship with. So the underwriting of those deals much easier than going into the market. Okay, and that's fair. What about the other 50% though? Because nobody sure. is trying to underwrite bad credits. Yeah. So if it's a new borrower, why yeah. would they take money from Aries? If there's somebody else, another lender, sure. who's willing to offer more generous terms. Yeah. In other words, you know, flip the relationship sure. around, I, I think pay price, more than you. Yeah, price is one element, but at the end of the day, what I've experienced over 25 years making direct loans is there's a service component. So when someone borrows from somebody like Aries, they're looking for flexibility, creativity and structure, the ability to scale with them, uh, the ability to be a good partner as they're looking at acquisitions and growth investments. So price is one factor when someone decides who to choose as, as a lending partner. But unlike what we see in the liquid markets, it's not the defining factor in every decision that people make. How, on a broader basis, are you managing the deterioration of credit standards? Well, you know, it's funny when you think about credit, as I said, it's all about asset selectivity and covenants only come into play in situations where a borrower is underperforming. So if your underwriting is sound and you're backing good companies, whether you have covenants or not, uh, hopefully you're going to have good outcomes. So what we're trying to do in a market where structures are, are deteriorating, whether that's definitions of EBITDA or weakening of covenants, is continue again, focus on quality first and then get the best structure in the best terms that we can. But at the end of the day, our performance is going to come from developing relationships with the best companies. There's no way around that. There's an interesting and awfully large deal that may come to market sometime in the near future. Yeah. Warren Buffett has yeah. pledged $10 billion of equity toward an Occidental takeover of Anadarko. Mm -hmm. It's now mm -hmm. a battle between yeah. uh, Oxy and Chevron. Yeah. Is that the kind of deal that you would be eager to lend into? Well, you have to think about Aries. So in our $130 billion, about 100 of is in, in credit. And of that 100, about 70 is in the private markets mm -hmm. and about 30 is in the, in the public markets. So for a deal of that size, that would tend to find its way into the liquid part of our, mm -hmm. of our business. And again, for a high-quality borrower with a well-structured transaction, we'd absolutely love to play that. Have there been any discussions thus far that have involved Aries? No. No. Mike, Aries made the case in a recent white paper for a much wider universe yep. of credit activity. Uh, as you pointed out, you're already in direct lending, you're already in public debt, yep. but you're now talking about other things. What's the opportunity there? Well, in, it's in alternative credit. Yeah, it's interesting. We're it, right? sitting here at the Milken Conference. So if you go back and you look at the history of alternative credit markets and just take the high yield market, when the high yield market first came on the scene, it was, no one had ever heard of it. That was right? alternative credit. That was, that was truly alternative credit. <laughs> um, today, that's a $2 trillion market. The leveraged loan market followed on the heels of the development of that market. That's now a $1.2 trillion market. So when we start looking at things like direct lending, back to your earlier question about the competitive dynamic and the flow of funds, part of what you're witnessing is just the evolution of a third alternative market, which is direct lending. What we're seeing, to your point, is when you think about what drove the growth of these markets, it's been the debanking of certain parts of the capital markets. It's been changes in the regulatory capital framework. It's been changes in the appetite of the capital markets for smaller borrowers. Uh, it's been a shrinking of the securitization mm -hmm. market. And so what we're seeing now is on the heels of the direct lending emergence is a whole sector of the alternative credit market in asset-backed and asset-based investments that's exhibiting some of those same growth trends off of some of the same, same themes. The cynic would say that you see opportunity in this market because you're now a publicly traded company and you have to grow AUM. 
Uh, I don't think you have to grow AUM as a public company. What we hope is that if we perform well for our investors and deliver good returns, they give us more money, which fuels growth. I think the jeopardy is as a public company, if you pursue growth just for growth's sake, that could lead to bad investment returns. And first and foremost, Aries has to be focused and obsessed about delivering returns to our investors. Are you going to raise funds that allow managers to roam widely and more freely among different classes of credit within alternatives? It's a huge trend. The large institutional investors are giving us capital in what we would call diversified credit or go anywhere credit funds. And what they're really trying to capture is the arbitrage that exists between public and private markets, U.S. and Europe, senior and subordinated. So. I think people are seeing as the markets are evolving, the more flexibility they can give us as a manager, the more outperformance that we can drive. So and how much trend. of that kind of money do you manage now? It's probably about 20% of our business is in those types of, of diversified credit mandates and growing. And do you see that being a growth engine? I do. I do. I think the ability to take all of our capabilities on the platform and package them up in a solution where we're driving value not just at the asset level but through the allocation is, is a big opportunity for us. Is it intentional or accidental that in doing this you might end up driving out some of the hedge funds that have previously been active in things like real estate lending yeah. and structured credit? Uh, I would say it, it's intentional in the sense that the key to, to surviving the credit cycle is having the right capital for the, the market opportunity. And I think for better or for worse, most of the hedge fund structures, in my opinion, are not durable enough to deliver the kind of uh, capital you need in the market. Why? Uh, There's a capital liquidity mismatch? Yeah, I think you have, a liquidity, you have a liquidity mismatch on duration and candidly the return expectations tend to push people into the riskier part of the market which over time could actually lead to underperformance, but largely it's a liquidity mismatch. Do you think your LPs, your investors, are willing to settle for perhaps slightly lower returns from some of those credit classes than they might otherwise be looking for from a hedge fund? I do. I think so. Back to your first question, which is how do you navigate the cycle, is you have to focus on quality first, and we as an investment manager have to be willing to say to our investors, make less money now, but focus on quality and take advantage of the market when there's volatility and dislocation. Mike, Blackstone has finally decided to go down the same path F finally. Th that Aries <laughs> went down more than a year ago, yep. which is to say converting from a publicly traded yep. partnership mm -hmm. to a so-called yep. C-Corp. Why is it important that Blackstone has made that decision? I think it's great for Blackstone. I think it's great for the alternative asset managers. Uh, I'd like to think that we provided some leadership in going the first, first a, a year ago. The logic behind the conversion is simply to unlock liquidity and valuation in the stock. Uh, what a lot of people don't appreciate, it's hard for most investor classes to own publicly traded partnerships. So what we decided was by converting, we would see increased liquidity in the stock. And that's absolutely happened. Our total return was 16% since our conversion against the S&P at 10%, the S&P uh, financials at 3%. Uh, we saw a five-fold increase in our daily volumes. 80% of our investors have turned over to be long-only or indexed investors. So the reason it's important for Blackstone, A, you've already seen it's unlocked huge value for Blackstone's shareholders, stock well, price performance. Early since days yet. But you're seeing that technical lift, which is important. For us, we need more liquidity in the market. We need people to be telling a simplified story about the growth opportunity in alternatives, and we all need to be telling it together. With Blackstone being the largest market cap company now making the conversion, my expectation is we'll see more investors being attracted to the asset class, which is good for everybody. There's a trade-off, though. Obviously, there are things you're looking for in converting to a sure. C-Corp, but in making that conversion, right, you're, you're gaining greater tax liability. Yeah, it it, again, it depends on the company. One of the reasons it was easy for us to go first is we have a higher percentage of our revenue from management fees that was getting taxed anyway. I think as you move down the spectrum, the more focused you are on private equity investing versus carry. credit and yeah. carry, the tax changes. So like each, Carlisle, right, for example. Each company's evaluation is going to be different. I think Blackstone was in the sweet spot where they articulated a willingness to take some future earnings dilution to unlock the liquidity in the stock. And again, it's early days. but They it's, decided it's that was a fair trade-off. Yeah. How do you reconcile what seems to some to be a bit of an irony, right, that, that firms established by swashbuckling bankers to exploit private markets yep. now have to, if not have to, you know, feel compelled right. to, 
to become ordinary tax-paying companies. I'm, I'm picturing some of my partners with an eye patch and a saver now, and I, I'm not quite sure I'm going to ever be able to uh, unsee that. I, you know, I think it's the natural evolution of all things, and it goes just back to the early days of the high-yield market, uh, where many of the folks here got, got their start. As the market evolves, we have to evolve as, as investors and as companies. And when you just think about where these global markets sit and the importance of scale, both in the investment business and the non-investment business, being public for a lot of us is almost an, an inevitability just in terms of the maturation of, of the business. So um, it's hard to say whether it was good or bad, or, um, but in my opinion, it was somewhat inevitable just given the, the way that the markets are developing and the demands of from, the and the shift from public to private yeah, assets. For sure.